welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at The Rock. So if you would please, uh, if you would stand to your feet and uh, let's go before the Lord in prayer and ask God to really prepare our hearts. Father, we're so grateful that tonight as we come in your house, we acknowledge, Lord, that we can do nothing without you. We need you, Holy Spirit. There can be many distractions, and uh, we don't want any of that, because tonight, Lord, you really want for people to leave this place different from when we came in. And all of us, Lord, speak to our hearts. Here we are. We present to you our hearts. We open it wide. Come, Holy Spirit, do the work that is needed. You know exactly where we're at what our point of need is tonight. So through your word, through the testimony that will go forth tonight, Lord, just do the work in every heart. And Father, we will give you the praise. We will give you the glory for all that you will accomplish here tonight. In Jesus' mighty name. Everybody in agreement say amen. 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 Please be seated. So um, would you want to just say... Yes. Something, well, my hello, love. everybody. We're going to just tag team off of each other. Is that okay yeah. with you guys? Okay. Well, what an honor it is to be here tonight to talk to you. We just honor all of you married folk in here. I'm glad you came. If you are here without your spouse, hallelujah, you're going to learn something tonight. But tonight's message is for everybody. If you are married, or if you're going to be married, if you want to be married, if you have been married, or if you don't know it, that you're going to be married someday, or you know somebody who's married, that you can minister these truths to them. So we have been married for 30 years, as he said. So um, let me just back up a little bit. We're going to give you a little bit of our testimony. And at the hand of our testimony of our life together, we are going to lift out some truths and some amazing things that God has done for us that we know God can do the same for you than he's done for us. So our topic tonight is how to stay standing in storms. This is part one of our marriage series, and we are particularly going to speak about storms. I think we are known as the stormy couple, marriage people, or something to that effect. Uh, We have just been through a lot, been through a lot. We are currently... um, in a, in a time of peace, well, never quite as a believer are you in a time of peace. There's always a war that we are fighting. Yep, yep. But we are, as far as our marriage is concerned, truly, I am more in love with him. I didn't think it was possible today than the day I met him. It's this month, about 30 years ago, that we met. Four months later, we were married. We got married. And I would not recommend that to any one of you. (laughs) If you want to get married within so many months, come see us first, okay? We've done it, we know. Um, But it's good. God God has been good to us. Our kids are here. We have three children, two boys front row, my daughter there, my amazing son-in-law, amazing children, and a grandbaby in, in, in the kids' area. So God has truly brought us to a place of blessing that it's impossible for us to even you know, uh, tell you how blessed we are because God has been good to us. Amen, amen. But I want to start with a scripture that will really kind of uh, launch us into the word tonight and help us to see, you know, uh, how the devil for sure is going to try and come against us as uh, we get married and as we stand in relationships. There's going to be some storms. And uh, I want to take us straight to Matthew 7, 24. And again, I'm just going to read one scripture because I can read the whole segment there. But uh, for the sake of time, listen to what the word says. The Bible says in Matthew 7, verse 24, and the rain descended. Um, Okay. Um, Let's do I have the wrong one there. Therefore, Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Keep going. Is there more? That's it? Okay. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the wind blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Now listen. 
I can tell you, really, that's the secret. If we talk about marriage and any relationship that you may find yourself in, unless you have something solid underneath of you, it will never work. It will never stand. And so praise God that um, as we share with you tonight about the rains and the floods and the storms that came in our relationship, um, I can tell you, if it wasn't for the fact that we knew God, we would never have survived. That's the very first thing that I want to tell you as we get started tonight. Yeah, and it's really serious because here are the statistics about divorce. I don't know if you knew that. I think you know the first one. Statistically, the best statistic you can get your hands on, 50% of marriages fail, okay? Um, and that is first marriage. Second marriage, it goes up to 64% of second marriages fail. Third marriage, it goes up 76%. A third marriage has failed. So look at your spouse and say, I'm going to stick it out with you. <laughs> I'm going to stick it. Listen, where you are tonight, the relationship you are in, and especially if you serve God, nothing is impossible to God. Amen. And I guess our story, uh, we met in the church. Yeah, I think that's so really that's a, a key, a key where you meet your spouse and who that person is. Yeah. Because we met each other in the church. Yeah. That's where yeah. we met. Yeah. Don't go looking for a life partner somewhere in the bars. What are you doing? What do you think you're doing? You need to understand this. That's why I read that scripture. Come on. Anybody that want to build a house, and really marriage is like building a house. Anybody the, the word says, anybody that's going to build that house on the sand, that's foolishness. How would you want, how can you even imagine for any house to be solid and strong in the midst of floods and, and, and storms if it's not built on the right foundation? And so thank God, God helped us that we met each other in the church and... Um, that's where it started. Yeah, and to the single people in here, you know, I grew up in the church. This is the church I was born and raised and grew up in. And, and I was told by my mom, there's no husband for me in this church. I mean, seriously, look at the guys. Just look, you know. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> what good can come out of, you know. <laughs> and sure enough, you know, I got to a place I had uh, engaged to be married to someone else and broke that engagement because God, it wasn't God's plan. And I said to God, I don't want a husband. I don't want anybody. And besides, there's nobody around here. You know, I don't see anything here that looks like any talent to me. So, and one day I just stayed faithful. I was there every time the doors opened. I looked for God. I served God. And one day Mr. walks in. And, you know, somebody, a good friend introduced us, long story short, um, I didn't think he was, you know, all that, because he was actually, you know, I tell you the truth, he just came, and this is for those of you of broken relationships and, and things in your past that you think you may not overcome, just going to throw that in there for another time. I met him, and he was just getting over, or being healed by God, grieving the loss of his first wife. He was married, very young. His wife got pregnant. She was about six months pregnant, and she got sick instantly. She had an aneurysm. She died. The baby died. He buried his wife, his young wife, and his little baby. And, and this is the man that I, I heard about his history, and I have total respect for this, but I said to my mom, that is one guy I don't want anything to deal with. You know, that is the kind of baggage that I don't think I can handle. <laughs> but God was faithful. He walked mm. in, we met, and we were married. And one year later, God after called we got us married, into yeah. ministry. Now, let me tell you, if you think being called into the ministry is going to be just absolutely the best thing that could ever happen to you, uh, you, got, you got news. I tell you, I, I can tell you the truth. Being in ministry can put a lot of strain on any relationship. It's tough. Even now, yes, you are serving God together, mm -hmm. but uh, the people factor comes in, and uh, people can really hurt. How many of you can say, yes, it's true? People could really hurt you. And when you are a pastor of a church, and you're trying your best to 
serve people and pour your life out for them, and they stab you in the back and they backbite and all kinds of stuff like that, I tell you, that'll really, mm -hmm. really yeah. test you. So certainly, you know, we, um, we went through it when God called us into ministry in different times yeah. and different stages. Yeah. And when we went to seminary, we lo left our jobs. I had a yep. full-time a career, he had a career, and we just up and left and followed God, you know, yep. followed God cross country. Little did we know after he graduated from seminary, I thought we were now going to be, you know, the pastor of a church. I'm going to buy my pretty furniture, get my parsonage in my house yep. and blah, blah, blah. And so when he graduated from seminary, he came to me and said to me, God has been speaking to me. And I'm like, oh, great. What's this time? So this was our commission to go overseas for us to come to the United States and study here. So and another three or so years later, he graduated. We came over to the States, and for time's sake, let's just go into what happened nine months after we arrived in the United States. Now, just to remember, we were what I thought was really we were faithful to the call of God. First of all, to get into the ministry, and then secondly, to... Uh, go further my studies after seminary here in the United States on the East Coast is where we went. And so I absolutely were in the um, feeling that I, I, I felt I am 100% in God's will. And even when you are in God's will, completely, listen to me, married couples, listen to me, even when you know that you know that you're in God's will, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to have no storms because that's when the storm even really came against us. So go ahead. Yeah, and but a great on. place to be when those storms hit. Oh, yeah, that's where you, you know, need to be. It's, it's that you know, when you know you're in the will of God, you're, you're halfway there. So we came to the United States, lived on the East Coast in Virginia. We attended Regent University. Nine months later, my baby's sitting there. She was two years old. Um, he got burned in a car accident with gasoline. We were poor students. He was fixing cars. We ate off of, you know, little businesses we had. Couldn't work, had no working permit because we were aliens, car card carrying aliens in this country. And um, there was an accident. Uh, the car engine backfired. He had gasoline in his hand. He was priming something, you guys would know. And he spilled, he had shorts on. He spilled the gasoline on his legs and that gasoline set on fire. So the gasoline was burning on his legs, f leaping up on his clothes. I saw it all. I was there following him in another car. So from one moment faithful, you know, we're going to change the world to the next minute, my husband literally up in flames. I mean, and that started a journey that nothing in this world could have prepared us for. No. You know, to see my husband in the claws of death, anyone of you know about burn victims, he was out of it. He, his body swole up unrecognizably. Doctors told me from the accident they didn't think he was going to make it to the hospital to begin with. When I saw him there at the accident, he, it looked, his skin was burned white. And it looked like somebody just took the skin and just ripped the skin off of his body, exposing flesh. He was burned so much that there was no place they could take skin to do skin grafts. So they did cadaver skin, donor skin, and I can tell you what, I was with my husband in the hospital, and I could smell death on him. He smelled like death, dying flesh, burned up the flames, bottom of his chin was burned, the bottom of his nose, his eyebrows were gone, his face, his beautiful face oh. was good, but, um, you know, devastating, absolutely and I was weak. Uh, you know, I was obviously be, uh, being burnt like that. I'm not going to tell you that testimony because uh, uh, there's no time for that. We want to get to the marriage stuff. But, you know, the bottom line is at that stage, I was so weak. I could not even lift my Bible or nothing. That's how weak I was. I, I could not do anything. I mean, I was in death. So she had to be strong. She was the one that really had to be there all the time and, you know, be strong in faith and speak faith all the time. And so for the three months that I was in that hospital, slowly getting better, slowly getting stronger, she's the one that really had to carry 
And you know what? Some of you, you know what it is like to really carry a strong load. A, a loved one that is sick, um, that is going through stuff. And you, you need to be the strong one during that time. Now, what we found is the moment I started getting stronger, she started falling apart. She started uh, experiencing burnout, so to speak. Because at that stage, uh, bills kept coming in. It was one bill after another. I mean, th there were so many bills that um, we didn't know how we, yeah, we yeah. could get through that. Yeah. God's grace carried me. But for those of you, we saying this, where, how does this connect to being married? I'm telling you, when you go through any kind of a trauma in your life, that's even not related to your relationship. It takes a toll on your relationship. Yeah. And you know, we didn't know it then. Yeah. Years later, we had ministry by one of our friends that came to us, sent by God and said to us, how are you guys doing? Everybody's just so happy. My husband is alive. Everything is okay. I'm starting having, having nightmares and flashbacks of my husband up in flames and and dying on the inside of me as he's getting better and, and still, you know, trying to be there, be the mom and raise my baby and all that. And throughout time, it wasn't over just like that. When you go through traumas and things hit you and disappointments come and sadness come your way, it takes time for you to heal, you know? It takes time for you to get ministry. But I think it may help some of you just to know Things that you've gone through in your marriage that's not related to your marriage, it can actually pull you apart. This mm -hmm. thing, we've gone through so many things that had all the potential in the world for us to be pulled apart. Seriously, two hard-headed people like us to begin with, just being married in perfect circumstances, is a challenge in itself. So us standing together here after 30 years is a miracle in so many ways. Amen. So many ways. Praise the Lord. So, and you know, uh, you just think that you're getting through one thing and then the next, next thing comes. How many know about that kind of stuff? And uh, the devil never plays nice. How many of you uh, seen that in your life? He's not a gentleman. He'll never, when you are down, leave you alone. So, um, at that stage, um, the next thing that hit us was um, our son, uh, our oldest son, Neil, was born and he had some real serious medical issues, medical problems. And I tell you, if anything can, um, can test you, it's, you know, when, when, the, when there's an attack on those that you that you love your children. When your children are affected and, uh, and there's an attack on their lives, um, my goodness, um, it will also put a huge strain on your relationship as a married couple if you don't stay solid on the foundation, if you don't connect with Christ all the time and you don't find your strength in Christ all the time. I remember when the, the day we had baby Neil, who's now 23, sitting here, and a miracle, a miracle child. Um, we were at the doctor's, he was a couple months old, and the doctor told us, your child can't see, your baby is blind. Devastating. But we want to tell you, God has the last word. Amen. He, Amen. Kept in there, I, I went in my mind, we're going to have to live in a place where there's a school for the blind. We looked at all that. Our church came together and we prayed and we spoke the word. And Amen. we said, Lord, we are not accepting this. Yes. And we prayed and we believed God. And yep. he's wearing a pair of glasses today, but so are many of you. But he can see, he drives his car. He is a miracle. I'm sorry, I'm just being a mom. And you know, the doctors told us, the doctor said, now you just make sure you don't get pregnant again. I mean, having a husband burn 75% of his body and getting pregnant again, you know, was, was, he was healed enough to have another baby. <laughs> Praise God. You know, oh, yeah. he wasn't burned that badly. So. <laughs> so we had Neil a 
And then Heinz is going, oi, oi, oi. Um, then the doctor said, don't get pregnant again because we couldn't figure, like, they couldn't diagnose what was really d d troubling Neil. Don't have another baby, but you know how. We didn't plan it just before I knew I was pregnant again. And there God had the last say again. Our third child was born and he's sitting in the front row. He's 21 years old and he is healthy as healthy can be. So just a testimony yep. of, you know, you, you can, you have this battle with the medical world too. When you go through stuff, listen to what the doctors are telling you, but believe what God is saying. Yes. So Hallelujah. God wants, listen to this scripture with this week. We'll conclude. There's so many other things. Psalm 66, 10 to 12 says, For you, O God, have tested us. Yeah. You have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. We went through fire and across the water, you know, yeah. from another country. A couple of times. But you brought us out to rich fulfillment. Amen. I love that. Rich fulfillment and we can stand here tonight and tell you this is true absolutely absolutely so you know after neil um then uh, we went back to south africa um i only had a four-year visa while i was studying and so i went back um, knowing that god really called us to be pastoring in the united states but we had to go back for a period and so i went back and pastored a church i came to a church i was called to a church that was absolutely divided. So I can tell you, pastoring a church that is divided, they were divided because uh, half of them wanted to get out of that building, the other half didn't want to get rid of that building, they wanted to stay in that building. Boy, was that a battle, a huge battle. And so we had to deal with a lot of uh, talking, you know, about the pastor, the pastor says this and the pastor says that. Anyway, uh, thank God we got through that. God sustained us. And then we came back to the United States. I started pastoring on the East Coast. And um, uh, again, we pastored a church um, where there was a lot of problems within that congregation. And God carried us through that um, only because of his grace. But during that time, Eleanor was grieving at that stage. When we came back to the United States, she started a grieving process for South Africa. She wanted to be back there. And how many of you know that sometimes, um, you know, the husband is going one direction and the wife wants to go another direction? And, uh, and so how do you navigate that? I mean, all I could do is I, I knew God spoke. God called us to be back there. God called us to be pastoring there. Yet, in spite of that, she had to deal with the loss of her family. And that was for her a very tough time. To the point where after four years almost of grieving, I, I came to the point where I told her, you know what, I think we just need to pack our stuff and go back. That scared me. Yeah. When the man said that, I mean, I didn't marry a sissy, you know. <laughs> He's like, oh, he has said it, you know, this is the way it's going to be. And when he said that, I, 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 I was shocked. I was like, no, 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 uh, well, let's follow God. So, but God healed me from that too. God did a miracle in my heart. God did a total miracle in my heart because of the separation. And we say this to you again, this takes a toll on your marriage. Yep. You know, Anytime there's a strain. I tell you, um, you need to stay close to God. Otherwise, you'll never make it through that storm. Yeah. Here is, here is what, what sustained me. First of all, Psalms 119, verse 92 and 93 says, Unless your law had been my delight, I would then have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts. For by them you have given me life. God's word has sustained me. There have been times in his sickness when I would walk out of the hospital room, didn't know if I was, was going to see him the next morning. I had to get in my car and drive home. And I remember saying, God, even if you had turned your back on me, I refuse.
refuse to stop following you. I will pursue you, which was not the case, but that's how I felt. You know, I said, God, even if you turned your back on me, I'm going to get you. I'm going to find you. I'm going to follow you, and I'm going to grab a hold of you. Yes. So the word of God, first of all, was what, you know, helped me during that time. Secondly, Proverbs 12, verse 4. This is one of my key scriptures. An excellent wife um, is the crown of her husband, but she who causes shame is like rottenness to his bones. Okay, ladies, look at your husband. Does he look like a king? Or does he look like somebody whose bones are rotting? I mean, seriously, this is what the Word of God says, right? If he doesn't look like a king to you, it's because you haven't crowned him yet. Okay, that is an amazing scripture. You are an excellent wife. And I looked at that word excellent in scripture. It talks about war, actually. It talks about strong as in, in, in an army, strong, strong for, for, for war and a display of valor. So, so that excellent wife the Bible talks about, you become a crown for your husband when you stand strong and you grab a hold of the word of God. And we can do that. Us as girls, we can do that. Grab When we really want something, guys, hold your ears. But girls, when we really want something, men, we will figure out how to get it. That's just who we are. Lord, help us. So, <laughs> yeah, may God really help you. <laughs> so... Yeah, we figure it out, and that is what that scripture means. And then the last one here that I wrote down is Proverbs 14, verse 1. A wise woman builds her house, but the foolish pulls it down with her hands. It doesn't say when times are good. Mm. It doesn't say when you've not been disappointed. It doesn't say this goes for you girls when you are just happy when your husband is all loving towards you and he's just treating you like a queen and everything is just perfect. No, it doesn't say that. It says the wise woman builds her house, period. The foolish one pulls it down. So I had to learn through the tough times that I was still responsible, you know, for the goodness in my house. I was still responsible for setting the temperature in my house. And I just want to tell you women out there, doesn't matter what you are going through. You've been gifted by God with the capacity to in the midst of the toughest time to still remain standing. Grab a hold of the word of God and bring the goodness of God into your home, no matter what. Hallelujah. And um, I, I'm going to um, go to the guys for a moment and just tell you that what I've learned through these 30 years of marriage is... Um, Ephesians 5.21, I'm just going to quickly go there because of time. The word says, and that's really the start of Ephesians 5, talking about marriage, what marriage is all about. But this is actually the very first scripture that we need to really understand. And I think uh, this is a tough one for the men, but it's something that I think you need to hear and you need to understand. Submitting to one another... In the fear of God. You know, normally, uh, most of us, we just want to think, well, you know, I'm the head of the house, and uh, my wife has to submit to me as the head of the house. Boom, that's it. Come on. Listen to what the Word says. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. So what I've learned as a man, you know, normally men has to be, we have to be strong. You know, we have to be uh, uh the strong one in the relationship. And so there's a lot of pride on the inside of us that God has to deal with. And so when those pressures come, I'm telling you something here today that you have to hear me. You have to hear what I'm saying to you. If those tough times come, unless you learn to be pliable, you're going to break. Something's going to break. That's where the word submitting to me, what submitting means is you become pliable. Hey, hey, God's desire, more than anything else, is that two people that are absolutely different become one. And the only way you ever will become one is when both of you learn to become pliable. Don't be so rigid. That's why I think I got to that point where I said to her, you know what, I think... Um, I, I saw her grieving 
And I, I said, you know, I think we just need to pack our bags, go back. And I think maybe God waited for that, for me to get to that point where I was soft enough to say, okay, I'll, I'm going to do whatever you feel we need to do. And that, that's when God changed her heart. And I tell you, after that, we've become stronger than we've ever been because of the fact that we could really learn to submit to one another. I see many couples that uh, that's the problem. Both of you, your heads are so hard. You have made up your mind. And you're not ready to even listen to the word of God in order for you to change your ways. You're so rigid in your ways. And that's one of the things that we struggle with most. People that are hardened. Well, let me tell you, only God can help you to get softer on the inside. So you become pliable. And you learn to even submit to one another. You don't always have to have your way. You need to learn that if you want to have a strong relationship. You say this in a conflict, since you were going there. In a conflict, when there's a fight and you are married, I think it works for friendships too. If you are married and you're in a conflict and there's a fight, if you win the fight, you just lost. Yeah. Because in your marriage, if you win the fight, somebody lost. So you have to figure what is more important, to win the fight, to say the last word, to be the one that is right, or to go for God in your marriage and do whatever it takes to bring peace to your marriage. So just remember next time, <laughs> really, when you win the fight, you say, I told you so, you know, I don't know all that. When you do that, you just lost ground in your marriage. You just lost ground because then there is a loser. And that is not the way to go in, 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 in a relationship. It's not about who's right. Yeah. And if you think about that, that's a tough one. It's easy just to say it. But it doesn't matter what you're going through. It is not about who is right. Where do you see that in Scripture? As a matter of fact, we can go there another time. But that is eating from the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. When somebody is evil and somebody is good, somebody is right, somebody is wrong. But when you give in and when you submit in your relationship, you are eating from the fruit of the tree of life. Because as you become less, God becomes more. There's no way you can be happily married when you fight for your rights and we, you always have to be right. Because in God's kingdom, marriage is God's idea. The way up is down. And the way down is up. So in order to... to um, be, have a godly relationship. You cannot be the one that wins every argument. All right. So I know there's many of you that may be sitting here tonight that are going through all kinds of storms and troubled times, hard times. I just want to give you some good news from the Word of God. If you will stay close to God, God has some real strong promises in his word for you. One of them is in Isaiah 43. I'm going to read it to you real quick. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. So we want to close and give you some tools tonight because our time is up. I, I don't want to let you leave here. And, um, you know, for us always, we're also heading up the marriage ministry here at The Rock. And um, we always want to try and help you with some tools to help you to do things in a way that will benefit your relationship. And so we're going to give you a couple of tools tonight. Is that okay? Are you ready for some tools? Yeah. Now listen, it may sound very simple, but many times it's the simple things that is the most powerful and profound. So 
don't look at the simplicity of what we're going to say to you and say, ah, well, that, that's, uh, that's not going to do anything for me. Believe me, try this and you'll see it will. So um, we want to bounce off of Ephesians 4. You want to read that? Um, Ephesians 4, verse 29 to 32 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Wow, how is that to start with? <laughs> uh, excuse me. <laughs> when you go home tonight, if you're married, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Some of you say, what in the world are we then going to be talking about? <laughs> That's a good question <laughs> you need to answer. But what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Now, when we sit in church and we read scriptures like this, we say, this is what we do. We say, oh, yeah, that's a general statement. I think of my neighbors. I think of somebody with me in church. Or better even, you sit there and you say, oh, I know who this scripture is for. You know, you have this person in your head. You say, yeah, I know somebody like that. Hello, this is for you. Yes. This is for you. Okay. Um, impart grace to the hearers. It starts with your spouse. It starts with the one closest to you. If you are not in a relationship and in a marriage where you impart grace to those who listen to you, we want to tell you tonight, you are out of line with God's word. So, and we're going to help you. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness... These are things in marriages that grows rampantly. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another. I want to say the one another of scripture starts with your spouse. Yep. Be kind. How many of you can say, don't show me your hands. How many of you, when is the last time your spouse was actually kind to you? How simple is that? We see couples all the time. There's no kindness left. No kindness left in the relationship. So be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ forgave you. So we're going to give you some tools, and we just want to just challenge you. Think about your own marriage. Look at your own marriage. Guys, you're not going to make it 30 years and be happy if you don't do it God's way. Mm. You may make it. I have seen too many miserable older people. You know people like that? They're older. They've been together like forever. But boy, oh boy, it's like, ah, oh, I get hives close to them because there's just a miserable thing going on. But if you want to grow old, even if you have fallen out of love, listen to this. If you don't fall out of love at some point in your marriage, you probably just won't admit it. You, there will come a time that you fall out of love. The butterflies fly away. It's like, where did they go? I don't have those anymore. So what has to happen before you get married and when a honeymoon time, you feel and then you do, right? And then you want to be married 30 years and still feel and do. Doesn't work like that. The moment you get married, it switches. You do and then you feel. You do out of obedience and then you feel. You will still feel, but you have to do first, okay? So we want to challenge you. It doesn't matter where you are at. If you want to work on your relationship, and we harp on this in our office too and the couples that we see, and you would not believe how hard this is for couples. We give them this at homework, and we give them a week or two to go do this, and they come back and they say, ah, we, we did it, but it didn't qualify because they didn't do the rules. This is the simplest thing. Now, this is where we start in spiritual guidance. If you cannot do this one thing, we can't help you. And this is called a date night. When's the last time you dated? Okay? Here we're going to make this available to you. We're not going to go through all Outside, of that right now yeah. because of time, but there's all of them out there at the info booth. You can pick them up right after. If you were at the marriage dance the other night, we handed them out too, and yeah. we'll hand it out till Jesus comes and gets us. Till yeah. you, because this because is so all it important. does, it helps you to really do what the word yeah. says. Yeah. You need to learn to speak positive into yeah. each other 
and loving words and, and really bless each other with the way you speak to each other. Yeah, so there are five rules. If you break one of these five rules, you just disqualified your date, okay? So this is a successful date. You can pick up one of these, pick up, give it to somebody. And seriously, it's the simplest thing, but you may be at a point in your marriage that this may be the hardest thing for you to actually do. The second tool that we're going to give you tonight is what I call the reset button. And, um, you know, all it is really, it's if you think in terms of a computer system that, um, you know, gets all messed up with all kinds of stuff, and then you have to finally hit that reset, and then it will reboot, for those of you that know uh, computer language, and it will go through a whole new uh, startup and throw out all the junk, and you have a clean system, so to speak, again. You know, um, God graciously gave us a reset also for marriages. It's God that blessed us with the ability to hit a reset. And how many of you would love to have a reset in your relationship? Just throw out all the garbage that you're struggling with, all the issues, all the anger, all the um, problems that you are you know, uh, feeling towards each other. How many of you would want to walk out tonight saying, oh, that's gone, I'm starting a new page? Wow, wouldn't that be great? Well, we, we're going to help you with that tonight. Here it is. Listen again to what Ephesians um, Ephesians says, the very last uh, line in that verse, it says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And so, you know, I, I get couples to sit and um, I tell them, you need to learn to really, really forgive and to move on. God forgave you. How can you not forgive your spouse? Every one of us mess up. We all make mistakes. But by the grace of God, he forgives us. And we need to learn to do the same for those that are close to us. So for the couples tonight, I'm going to challenge you to actually do that. As a matter of fact, right now, if you're ready, if you're going through some stuff and you want to walk out of here different than when you came in, this is holy ground. You're in the house of God. Can we practice this real quick? Are you okay with me? Everybody stand up, would you please? And every couple that's in here right now, if you want to have a reset for your relationship tonight, I want to challenge you to come out here right now, and we're going to help you with a reset. Any now, when couple, you come out, we are not saying, then you say, oh, my marriage is a mess. Listen, we... No, that's not what it's about. You need to, you need to just jump in any time. You can add some goodness come to your up, marriage. Come on up, so come on up, come on up. We want to challenge you, just come on up. This is good. This is good. Just the fact that you get out of your seat, you walk up here, you say, I want it. It takes courage, I know. But listen, God doesn't want you to stay where you're at. God wants you to go to the next level and have some breakthroughs in your relationship. And so tonight's your night. You can stay in your seat and just keep going the way you are. But tonight, God brought you here for a reason. And let me tell you, if he could have done it for us and helped us through so much, he could do it for you. Let's start with these simple things, okay? So just do what I tell you to do tonight. Is that okay? Amen. Just give it a shot. Just do it. You're in God's house, in God's presence. I'm going to tell you exactly what you're supposed to tell each other, okay? So let me start with the guys. Guys, I want you to take your hand, just the hands them. of... You just face each other. All of you. Now face each other. It's not about anybody just look at else each other. right now. Don't about don't worry about anybody else don't around. Look you. at anybody it's just else. You just you and your spouse right now. That's it. I want you to take a moment, and I want you uh, to just say to each other, say this, uh, say to your wife right now, all the husbands, because it's true. 
whether it was through words or actions, tell her, I know I hurt you. And I'm, for that, I'm really sorry. Would you please forgive me? And then wives, I just want you to look. God is moving right here. Just keep looking at each other. We all messed up. Look at your husband. Look at each other in the eyes and say to him, I know I have hurt you. And I am very sorry. I never mean to hurt you. Would you please forgive me? And you can respond, husbands. You can hug. You can give her a hug. Those of you standing without your spouse, speak this to the Lord. Your faith, God sees your faith that you came up here. You can just hold each other for a second there. Uh, well, let me talk to you one more moment, okay? It may look simple, but it's the most powerful thing you can ever imagine. When you can do this on a regular basis, you will be blown away by what God is going to do for you in your relationship. Yeah. Again, it's about becoming pliable, not be so hard that I will never do this. I, I'm the one that's right and she's wrong or he's wrong. Forget that. Even in your hardness, you're hurting each other. Stop doing that. Just learn to forgive. You're not perfect either. Learn to forgive. I tell you, when you hit that reset over and over, you'll be amazed what God is going to continue to do for you in your relationship. Listen, guys, this is a tool, okay? It's like a tool in your toolbox that you can do on a regular basis. We don't want you to say anything else. You don't say, I know I've hurt you, but I've just been trying to explain myself, and I've just always tried to, and I just, just stop, just zip it, right? This is all you say. You look in these or her eyes and you say, I have hurt you, really sorry. Would you please forgive me? Guys, it's a tool. Guys, men understand tools maybe a little better than women. We are the ones with lots of words, but we say, but what about this? But what about this? We heard this morning, Jesus died for you and me before we could even accept him. We heard it in the sermon this morning. So why can't, can you not, why is your forgiveness con conditional? Don't wait, guys. You're wasting your life. Don't. Just do this. We call this the reset. So when things get tight in the house, all you have to do, you look at each other and say, Reset, reset, and just come together. Take some moment, and and I can I can just see right here. I can I can just see. I can just see how God is working, and that's all you did. Powerful, because what you did now, you you came in line with the Word of God. No matter your feelings, and when you do that, guys, you are setting yourself up for goodness to come in your life Praise and the goodness. Lord. So why don't you look at each other and one of you invite the other to a date. Let's just take a second. Ask each other out on a date. Would you go on a date with me? That's simple, okay? All right, I want to pray. Everybody yeah. just bow your heads. Those in the audience, just stretch out your hands so as the couple see on the front. Father, this is a place where miracles happen right here in your Jesus. presence. Thank you for your anointing that breaks yokes in this house tonight. Holy Spirit, just come and do a mighty work in every heart. Every heart that is so hardened. Thank you that you soften. Let the rain of the Holy Spirit just soften hearts in this house tonight. Even those in the audience out there that still have unforgiveness and bitterness towards other people in their relationships. Thank you, Lord, that you help us to learn to forgive the way you have forgiven us. Help us to be a forgiving people. 
in Jesus mighty name and I thank you Lord that you bind these couples together now with cords that cannot be broken Lord fill them up with your love for each other and Lord that each and every one of them walk out of here different from what they came in in Jesus name everybody in agreement give a shout to God hallelujah, hallelujah. praise God praise God Thank you. You may go back to your seats. Praise God. So glad you guys came out tonight. But listen, all of what we said here tonight will be irrelevant if you don't have that solid foundation that we talked about earlier. And so for me, this is really the most important part of this service. And I have to challenge all of you here tonight. We've had a great time together talking about uh, you know, our testimony and, and the word of God and how it applied for us. But um, I need to ask you a very important question. You leave here tonight. And for some unreason, uh, unknown reason, you know, something happens and uh, your heart stops and you die. Will you open your eyes in heaven or will you open your eyes in hell? That's the question that I want to ask you. Just answer that question in your heart right there where you're at right now. Because it is the most important question ever for all of us. Maybe some of you are sitting there and you're saying, well, pastor, I hope that if I die that I'll go to heaven. Or maybe you say, I think, I think I, uh, I'll go to heaven. Show me where in the Bible the, does it say that you can just hope or that you can just think that you're going to go to heaven and that you'll go to heaven. You see, nowhere in the Bible can you find that positive thinking will get you in heaven. It doesn't work like that. See, it's God's heaven. You can't get there your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee way. The only way you're going to get to heaven is God's way. And Jesus made it very, very clear for us. He's the one that died for us in order for us to be able to go to heaven someday. And he's the one that told us. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father but by me. So his way is the only way. There's no other way. It's only his way according to the word of God. So maybe you're sitting here tonight and you're saying, well, pastor, you don't know me. I'm, I'm really a good person. As a matter of fact, I grew up in a Christian home. My mom and dad told me to uh, go to Sunday school class or catechism class or all these different classes. You know, and so uh, all my life as I grew up, I uh, did the things that I thought was the right things, and I, I'm really a good person. I mean, I even can quote some scriptures. I, I know quite a number of scriptures from the Old and the New Testament. I, I know some stuff about God. I, 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 know, I feel I know God. Listen, show me again. Show me in the Bible where it says that you can just quote some scriptures that you can say you know about Jesus and you know uh, I mean everybody in America knows about Jesus it's it's America we all so celebrate Christmas and Easter every year so everybody then can say well I know Jesus and I know about Jesus it's not what you have in your head that counts listen to this old man it's not what you have in your head that counts is what have you done with your heart? That's what counts. That's what I want you to grab tonight. Because, you know, maybe, maybe you uh, come from a, a great church where, where you even served in ministry there. You were singing in the choir. Uh, you were an usher taking up the offering, all kinds of stuff. They were thinking, uh, uh, looking at you as a leader in that church. It doesn't matter. I mean, you could have been the pastor of that church. Show me in the Bible where you being uh, somebody that does great things and being very uh, 
doing great things in the house of God, that that's going to take you to heaven. That, that's the answer. Let me show you the contrary. Here's a man in uh, John, the third chapter. Jesus comes to this man. His name is Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus really was like a pastor in a church because he was a teacher in the synagogue, and he knew the scripture in and out. I mean, if anybody knew the scripture, Nicodemus knew the scripture. Nicodemus was a great guy. Nicodemus, he gave his money to the poor. He did all the things that he felt were the things that he was supposed to do in order for him to be in heaven someday. And yet, when he asked Jesus about that, Jesus looked him in the eye and he looked and he, and he said to him, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born again. He didn't pat him on the back, say, oh man, look at Nic Nicodemus, I wish everybody could be uh, living such a great life like you do. He didn't do that. He looked him in the eye and said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And even for a man like Nicodemus that knew the scripture, he didn't understand that. He was thinking by himself, Jesus, I'm a pretty big guy and my mom has shrunk a little bit now and uh, I'm bigger than my mom. How can I be born again? And uh, Jesus looked at him and said, no, you don't understand, Nicodemus. I'm talking about a spiritual birth. You must be born again spiritually. What does that mean? That means that you and I, we have to give God all of our heart and all of our life. You see, when Jesus came, he gave us his life. He gave it all for us to be able to go to heaven someday. And so what he wants is for us to be able to give him all of our hearts and all of our lives. What he hates more than anything else is when you say, I want to go to heaven and I want to serve God, but you do it half-heartedly. You know, one day you're here in church, next day you're not. He hates that. As a matter of fact, he says in uh, Revelations, in Revelation third chapter, he says, when I come again and I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Jesus says that. Powerful words, graphic words. But really, what he is saying is what deep inside we all feel about people that are lukewarm, half-hearted. One day, you know, they, they really love you. We're talking about relationships here tonight. One day they act like they love you. Next day they act like the devil. Come on, what's that? That's half-hearted. God is speaking to you tonight. And he wants you to be in heaven someday. And for you to be in heaven someday, you must be born again. I know Hollywood may make a joke of that term, born again. I don't care what they say. You know, um, the word says, you and I must be born again. That's his way. That's the only way there is. Remember, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So tonight, I want to give you that opportunity to make that decision for Christ, to give him all of your heart and all of your life. Tonight's your night. Don't leave here tonight still not sure in your heart. So I'm going to give you an opportunity. How are we going to do that? Of course, we're going to do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. So in a moment, I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to give you that opportunity to raise your hand and to say, here I am, Pastor. Tonight's my night. I, tonight, I want to give God all of my heart and all of my life. Who should do this? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. 
If you've never done this, tonight's your night. Don't leave this place the same way that you came in. But tonight, give him all of your heart, all of your life. If you're not sure, come on, tonight, make sure. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Anybody out there? Anybody? There's one. Anybody else? Anybody else? One person. Two. Thank you. Anybody else? Come on, tonight's your night. Don't let the devil talk you out of this. You say, Pastor, you want me to raise your, my hand? I'll be embarrassed. Come on. A bit of embarrassment rather than being in heaven forever and ever. Don't let the devil tell you that. Anybody else? Come on. God is talking to you right now. Is there anybody else? Thank you. I see that hand. Three. Anybody else? Three wise people in the house already. Anybody else? Anybody else? God loves you. He wouldn't want for you to go to hell. He sent his son to die for you. Tonight's your night. Anybody else? Three wise people already. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Anybody else? Praise God. Let's give God a um, and three wise people in the house. Praise the Lord. Now listen, all three of you, you don't go to heaven just because you raise your hand. You need to, again, give God all of your heart and all of your life. We need to pray with you for you to do that. So in a moment, all of us are going to stand, and we're going to actually cheer you on. And listen, if you're sitting here and you were still a little shy, and you know God spoke to you, you're not sure. Make sure tonight. You're number four, you're number five, number six, whatever. Come on out. It's not too late. While we stand and welcome them, just come on out. Grab your stuff. Grab a friend. If you need a friend, come on up here. Let us pray with you. Praise God. Come on up. Thank you, Lord. I am decided. Praise God. Come on up, come on up. I am decided. Tonight's your night. To follow Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. No turning. Come on out. They're coming out of the family rooms. No turning. Hallelujah. Back. They're coming out. Praise God. Bring them up. I am Bring them up. Praise God. Praise God. Follow Jesus. Yes, Lord. They're still coming. They're still coming. It's not too late. Come on up. Come on up. It's not too late for you. Come on up. I am decided. Praise God. Praise God. Jesus. No turning down. Congratulations, everybody. This is the best decision of your entire life. So put a smile in your face. You're not gonna go to hell. You're gonna go to heaven. Best place ever. And um I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. This is Pastor Dave. He is gonna, uh, he's the nicest, kindest guy you can ever think of. No weird stuff goes on. He's just going to take you over there to a room where we're going to give you some free stuff. He's, there's three things he, he's going to do. He's going to pray with you. He's going to give you some free stuff and explain to you a program that we have here about SPTs, spiritual personal trainers. You know, we want you to go strong in the things of God quickly. That's what a spiritual personal trainer will do for you. It takes five weeks, and he'll explain all of that to you. But more than that, I want to I wanna challenge you. If you really, really want to have a strong, healthy life in the things of God, if you give the Rock Church a year of your life, you keep coming. If you commit to keep coming for one year, you'll never be the same again. I'm telling you, that is the truth. So, if you would like, make a left turn, follow Pastor Dave. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God.